front end. Is that okay? We are live now. Hi, uh, welcome everybody. This is the session on restarting the ERC courses. Hi, uh, welcome everybody. It's, uh, it's an extremely uh, interesting session because, um, because of COVID, of course, many courses has, uh, have stopped. Um, and this worries uh, me personally because I've seen uh, people not following courses and not, not having the right skills when they um, attend clinical uh, duty. Um, so today uh, we are together, by the way, I'm Kuhn Monsieurs, the chair of the ERC, and we have uh, two uh, co-moderators. One is Pat uh, Conahan. Um, Pat is a uh, nurse, a senior lecturer at the University of uh, Manchester, and she's the longest serving educator in the ERC, isn't it, Pat? <laughs> I wasn't going to say that again, but there you go. Um, and then there's Tino uh, Greif. Uh, Tino is uh, our Director of Training and uh, Education in the ERC. Welcome, uh, Tino. Uh, then we have the four um, co-chairs of education of our Science and Education uh, Committees. We have uh, firstly Carsten Lott, who will speak about uh, advanced life support. Then we have uh, Federico Semeraro, who will speak about uh, basic life support. Hi, Federico. Then we have uh, Patrick uh, van der Voorde speaking about uh, pediatric life support. Patrick, welcome. And then we have John uh, Maydar about neonatal life support. Welcome, John. And welcome, Karsten, also. Um, so we will be talking, or you will be talking about uh, restarting the courses about COVID, um, but also about new content and maybe also about new ways of delivering uh, courses. So without further ado, uh, I will give the word to uh, Karsten uh, for uh, advanced life support, please, Karsten. Okay, so welcome everybody. I hope you can see my screen now. Um, I got some good news for you and I got bad news as well. So good news is we do not really need to restart our courses because there are still advanced life support and immediate life support courses on the way. The number has been going down due to the pandemic, that for sure. At the moment, we are looking for different concepts in different regions and different countries, how we can run our courses, or how we can proceed with our courses. For example, I plan to run a series of immediate life support and advanced life support courses in my university hospital in two weeks from now. And actually, we are, actually we are discussing uh, if we do them strictly in internally, if we do only go for vaccinated candidates and instructors and stuff like that. But nevertheless, courses are alive and they are going on. My conflict of interest, once my slides work, here we are. So I'm the co-chair education of the ESC Science Education Committee Advanced Life Support, so directly involved with both course types. And to give you an idea how our course run and um, what's going to happen in the next two years, I'm going to reflect shortly on the content and the objectives of our courses. I think this could be an important point. We always have the problem to explain people the big differences between immediate life support and advanced life support and to tell people um, yeah, who is kind of eligible to attend kind of these courses. I think this, uh, this accounts for, uh, for, for the UK as well, uh, especially when we need to explain where the big difference between ACLS and advanced life support, respective immediate life support is. So if we look at immediate life support, our objectives when teaching immediate life support, we want to make people understand the management of the critically ill patient. 
they should recognize cardiac arrest once they are done. They should be able to start resuscitation and they should be able to perform as a team member in the resuscitation team. When we proceed to advanced life support, then we add all the peri-arrest situations, we add all the special circumstances, and we add the team leadership competencies. And this is where we get all the human factors, the non-technical skills on board. Yeah? This is getting back the team membership part in the immediate life support course, and it's the team leadership part in the advanced life support part of our courses. How do we achieve that? We achieved that at first by preparation. And we had a lot of discussion on that in the session preceding our session now. Uh, so we go for blended for space learning approach. And this is where we need to offer some course materials to our participants to prepare for the course. Uh, we had one question, uh, we had some discussion in the session preceding this um, kind of saying that two days are too short for a course to learn or to get all the competencies, competencies that are expected from an advanced life support provider. And that already commented in that session, our course is not only two days, our course is, uh, is, is, is a complex product. Yeah? And it contains preparational materials, it contains post-course materials, and it contains that on-site part. Now, and for preparation, we have a course manual, Good news for everybody out there, draft of the manual is already done. So there will be a new manual very soon, as soon as we have been able to get the layout done for that. But the new guidelines are already part of our new ALS and immediate life support course manuals. And another change will be there will only be one manual for both course types. You know, so there will only be one ELS and ALS course manual that is eligible for both types of candidates. We have our VLE, and the VLE goes hand in hand with our course manual. So we moved many content from the former ALS course manual into the VLE. We'll find it there and there will be close links uh, on all chapters of our new course manual to the VLE. The VLE is the extended version where you get a lot of visual aids of cognitive aids and a lot of background information on what is written in the manual and where you can deepen your knowledge on the single parts of our courses. And we have the assessment part, the mandatory pre-course test. This one will be mandatory and cozy to be able to come to the course center and to take the on-site part. Then we have our on-site course, and this on-site course for the adult parts consists of uh, different modular options. We have our basic level. The basic level, yeah, in the end, reflects basic life support in a shortened version. So everybody who's going to come and attends an immediate life support or an advanced life support course needs to be competent in basic life support. We move on to the immediate part. So this is our day one of advanced life support courses. Uh, it's the immediate life support course. We are talking about the deteriorating patient. We have facultative modules on ECG interpretation. We have airway and intraosseous success workshops. We are talking about the ALS algorithm. We have, demo we have demonstrations for our simulation training, and we have a number of simulation trainings to get candidates involved. This is followed by the advanced level, second day of advanced life support. This is where we integrate the non-technical skills that are relevant for team leadership. We have the specific workshops on rhythm problems, bradycardias, tachycardias. We're talking about blood gases, capnography, and we have a lot of simulations on special circumstances and on the team leadership bits we need to provide more courses. Day two is ended by the assessment parts. This is an MCQ and this is the so-called simulation tests where candidates need to prove that they're able to lead the team as a team leader. So why do we have that modular system? If we look at it from an advanced life support perspective, uh, then we always have candidates for whom ALS is too advanced that do not have team leader capabilities, that do, do not perform to a standard we expect from team leaders, or we have centers or candidates with limited resources time-wise or manpower-wise. Looking at it from an immediate life support perspective, uh, then we can progress to advanced life support once we We've done immediate life support and we got the competencies and we got the skills to move on. And it's part of our lifelong learning process. 
Uh, it makes things easier if you look at programs to restart courses in um, kind of looking at the logistics. You, know, you can have a big number of immediate life support candidates and can select the ones that are eligible to go for ALS. So you can teach fewer ALS candidates as well. You need, if you look at your resources, one day for each of the modules compared to two days if you do a full advanced life support course right away. Getting back to our achievement bits, uh, we for sure have assessments. Uh, these assessments are on the end of the second day for advanced life support. And we enable, we allow the candidates to follow things up uh, in a modular approach and by further using our virtual learning environment, covering all the content that is um, kind of relevant for advanced life support providers. What we are missing at the moment, and this is something uh, that makes courses uh, a bit less enjoyable, is the interaction part. So we still have kind of coaching, but as we are working in fixed groups at the moment, uh, um, we do not see that many candidates as we used to when running full courses. You know, coaching is meant to provide feedback. Uh, we have peer support within the groups, and what we do not offer at the moment are the social events you know, that further improve quality of our courses. We started the recertification process already last year, the lifelong learning using online modules. Uh, we need to do one online module at least within two years. We have hands-on recertification modules, you need to do one in two years as well. And at a specific, we have the assessment modules, you have to visit one of them once every five years. So I already told you that the new manual is ready to go and that the VLE update is ready to go pretty soon. This is the working group that invested a lot of time in producing all these materials within the past, you know, let's, say, let's say four to six weeks. It's been a lot of work besides the guideline process, but nevertheless, we felt it's important to have manuals and course materials ready to go once the guidelines are published. So short visit to COVID. Uh, I hope this video is gonna go to give you an idea how you can protect your learners when running courses during the pandemic. So first part, no protection at all. You can see the aerosols running all over the setting with a higher infection risk. Now we have the medical face masks. And see, adds a bit more of protection and getting back to your courses. And now we have the approach using face sheets as well. And this is what we do in our course center. And as it's getting close to summer again, you can use fans as well. And then you can see that aerosols are not driven to the simulation area. So the risk in running courses is hugely reduced by using that approach in restarting our courses. We set up a one day program that's covering immediate life support and advanced life support as well. And this is available via our course materials. So this is accompanied by an um, extended BLE part. You know, so during the pandemic, it's possible to run an immediate life support course with uh, the respective preparation <coughs> within <coughs> half a day. And you can use one day for advanced life support if you have the BLE in place as well. That's from my side. Thanks for the attention and happy to get your questions now. So, Carsten, there aren't specifically questions uh, related to restarting the course. There seems to be a lot of general ones. Uh, so, a question, can we get the video COVID showing this dispersion of particles? Yeah, sure. So, uh, this should not be a problem. I can upload it with the course materials. Okay. Um, and... Andrew Legrove mentions that all candidates and instructors are wearing FFP2 masks, use hand sanitizer and wear gloves uh, in ALS and EPAL safe environments with filtered air conditioning, heating and windows. 
Is that the level of protection you think that they should be going for? So uh, the filter systems in the rooms, I think this is a, is a problem. Yeah. So there's not really evidence behind that. You know? So having a frequent air exchange in the rooms, you know, I think this is the important part. Keeping distances, and if you are not able to keep distances, then wear your personal protective equipment you know, as uh, described by you. And this is the way to go. Uh, and I, there's a few questions here about the mannequins, which I think are probably better addressed by going to the individual manufacturer's guidelines around cleansing of mannequins. In general, in relation to ALFs, um, question from Christopher Bishop, arterial blood gases seems to be a topic dreaded by candidates and some instructors alike. Why is this and how can we address this? So I didn't get the first part of the question. Arterial blood gases. Yeah. Um, seem to be a topic dreaded by candidates and instructors alike. So they didn't get the English wording, sorry for that. So they don't like it, is it what yeah, you're sorry. saying? Yeah, sorry. Dreaded, <laughs> sorry. dreaded <laughs> is feared. It, it's ah. something that they worry about. Yeah, so fully understand, but um, this is what I meant with my introductory words. You know, we're talking about advanced life support. You know, so we have two different levels of competence for the uh, candidates coming to our courses. You know, somebody who leads a resource team, and this is the candidate we are aiming at in advanced life support, should be able to uh, provide interpretation for uh, arterial blood gases. Uh, and they should be able to use these to manage their patients because this is part of the overall resuscitation process and this is part of the post-resuscitation care process. We still offer immediate life support. Uh, immediate life support, this is in my experience, sometimes a bit problematic because the name, you know, people want to do advanced things. Uh, but if you look at the content of our immediate life support courses, this is comparable to what AHA offers with the ACLS courses. Uh, it's exactly the same. Uh, it does not contain arterial blood gases. Uh, they do not need to learn about that. Uh, and they are able to uh, manage patients in cardiac arrest, uh, but they will not be able to lead the resuscitation team in the end of the day. Uh, so perhaps, and this goes to all of you, uh, we need to think about in the end of the day if we rename our courses uh, and put immediate life support name-wise on an advanced level. This might help with that. Thank you. Uh, a question here from Tanya Esposito. How do you do the demo of CAS Teach in small groups when you've only got two instructors? There are two options for that. Option I do not really like, but uh, the option is what I use at the moment is to use a video for that. So commented video, you know, but exactly knowing that this does not provide the same amount of information as a live demo does. You know. Another option, and this is something we choose in immediate life support from time to time, is that you um, use some candidates you know, to provide the demo. I think um, this is more of a general question. I don't know whether we want to come to more COVID related at the end, uh, but this is, um, what's the view on double vaccinated health providers? Uh, yeah, it's, it's complicated, but to be honest about that, to be totally honest about that, I would prefer to only run courses with these uh, in the faculty and uh, for the candidates whenever possible. So in Germany, we are in a very privileged situation because nearly everybody in the healthcare system is vaccinated, is double vaccinated in the meantime. So this becomes increasingly uh, uncomplicated. Thank you, Councillor. I think that's captured the majority of the questions there. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pat, and thank you, uh, Karsten. Our next speaker is uh, Federico Simeraro on uh, BLS. Hello to everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me to this session. Uh, I share my, my slides uh, and a very small introduction to this presentation, only because only because you are aware what happened in Italy. So these are, this presentation is deeply affected about real life in Italy. So in Italy, we 
it's quite impossible to organize courses outside inside the hospital. Everything is blocked. We have a lot of new care professional in, in the hospital and out of hospital, and we struggle a lot to give some education and teaching to them. And from the perspective of my, I can say, uh, vision of the future, I'm a, a deeply worried about uh, the behavior of general population about restart courses and BLS. So this presentation is a little bit uh, disruptive and innovative. And the principle of this presentation is to in, try to invite all of you to rethink and restart uh, how we can manage BLS after COVID-19 and during COVID-19. This is my conflict of interest, deeply affected by uh, Star Wars and Star Trek. Sorry for that. And I invite you, this is the slide that uh, remember to me to say thank you to Tino and to the writing group of education chapter, because they take a lot of time to read this chapter. There are a lot of science there. There are a lot of very good suggestion. And I, I think in my experience, this was one of the best uh, education chapter uh, wrote before now. So take some time to have a look to that. Okay, we are in an evolution of communication. You know, uh, we started to, to, to teach BLS uh, in some way. We use uh, innovation things like e-learning, PC, and I'll try to a little bit try to convince you that we have to be a little bit disruptive. Uh, only to explain this word, innovation is doing the same things a bit better. And disruption is making things that make the old things obsolete. Only to understand how, how is the, uh, the, the meaning of disruptive. So let's us discuss today, and I'm very happy to reply to your question now after this presentation, but mainly during the general discussion, because uh, I'm very happy to report this to our next ERC conclave uh, to build the new way to restart ELS courses and teaching and education. I think nobody of us are, I can say, against this, or oh, please uh, write something on the chat. The target group mainly is general population, kids and students and healthcare professional. I think on this, I think we are not very disruptive. Second, knowledge. We spent a lot of time on the books. Now we are working uh, for many times on e-learning, virtual learning environment and COSI. For the future, maybe, uh, the knowledge we can use, social media, YouTube, we, we can integrate all the new things inside VLE and COSI. So for knowledge, I think we are on a good way. And I think we, we don't need to be disruptive. And as you can see, we have a new algorithm, we have a new infographics, we have VLE. So I can, I can say, but please, uh, I'm very happy to receive some comment on the chat. For the knowledge perspective, we are in a safe area. We are ready. We are, I, I can say, not affected by COVID-19 in terms of knowledge. And as a, a very nice example, I wanted to thank you, Patrick, and all the others that re realized this uh, in, during the pandemic. This is an example, very fast reaction of ERC. So the English, the coronavirus English variant of BLS and other courses on, on VLE. So this is a nice example to use technology in, in a very fast way to improve the knowledge during, the, uh, during a pandemic. Okay, this is the pain. How we can teach skill B BLS is mainly in skill, I can say. How we can teach skill? And this is an open question for all of you. Uh, I am, you know, I am a full believer 
that we can uh, teach skill through Zoom, like now, or we can use virtual reality uh, directly at home. Uh, I believe uh, that we can uh, use this, this new technology to avoid risk with COVID-19. Uh, we, we will talk about that maybe during discussion. There are a lot of example, uh, handmade CPR mannequin, very cheap, uh, the UK experience with, with augmented reality. Uh, in Italy, as you know, uh, uh, we develop virtual reality with strange gaming uh, platform. So exists a lot, a, a variation, a, a broad, a wide uh, type of tools that you can use on your own at home or uh, in, a, in an isolated room. So the big problem is behavior. This is not behavior you are looking for, but change is so scary. So maybe we need to break the paradigm. Maybe we need to change everything and maybe we need to accept the concept that we can teach skill, not in real life, not in the same room, uh, maybe connected with something. Uh, and this is open to your comment because I'm very happy to collect some comments from all of you. My last message, my last message is wash your hand and wear a mask and stay far, far away. Thank you. Thanks Federico for your insight into restarting or redoing PLS courses. From the questions, maybe this is, uh, the, what is the future of these courses? Uh, how can we bring more people to this basic life support courses? A lot of them do not need certificates. Uh, we still have this system of doing courses certificate. Is there any thought about this? Uh, as we discuss in some uh, in some meeting with uh, others experts in uh, in basic life support for community, for example, we need to 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 develop maybe different level of target group. For example, if you think to awareness for general population, uh, think about World Saturday Kids of Life. We can open to everybody with a very smart small, short uh, experience, video, apps, or something like that. Uh, or if you think uh, to uh, the experience during the Congress, uh, to give the healthcare professional some taste of BLS. This could be the, 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 the rumors, and, uh, sorry, the sound in the background. Obviously, for the care professional, if you think to the new uh, employee during the pandemic, we need absolutely to teach them BLS with BLS COVID-19 rules. So we absolutely need to certify them. So I, I think we, we, we have two, two possibilities, a big community, general population, kids, students, with new technology, uh, with a, a, a soft, I can say, certification, and for a care professional, uh, a classical approach uh, in terms of certification. Uh, maybe to continue, there are quite a lot of comments in the chat that they say awareness campaign, and so this is all fine online, but there's still a huge amount of people that say these are hands-on competences. The, 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 the argument is, you can learn hands-on only by doing hands-on. As I tried to provoke uh, this reaction before, you can uh, organize a, a, a meeting with the Zoom. You can ask to your students to create a, a mannequin uh, at home, and you can guide through Zoom on uh, hands-on skill station from Zoom. If you also have uh, an app that have some accelerometer inside of some apps that measure chest compression rate and depth, you can also uh, use something like that. I, I think it, 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 we, we need to be a little bit, uh, I can say, lean and disruptive. Because if we, if we want to continue in a classical way, uh, we haven't 
the possibility to run courses in real life. So in the meantime, and we don't know how is in the meantime, we need to find a, a, a B plan, a rescue plan, uh, as I suggested before. Uh, last question, and then we move on to the next one. Will the basic BLS Science and Education Committee provide some type of teaching material courses for this, this kind of teaching? The classic teaching, we have our courses. Any few in the future? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is in the future, absolutely. But the, the future, I, I, I don't really know how is the future of COVID-19. So we need to plan a backup plan, a B plan uh, in the meantime when we can restart the classical courses. I think it's quite imp not impossible to organize a BLS or also a, gener a generic instructor course, why not? Uh, on, on Zoom, uh, we can organize. I, we we receive a lot of, of skill during the last year on Zoom. So why not? This is open to a disruptive discussion with all the uh, instructors and director and NRC for the next conclave and for the next ERC NRC meeting. Why not? Thank you very much, uh, Federico. Very challenging uh, times uh, ahead. Thank you, Tino. Um, the next speaker is uh, Patrick van der Voorde about restarting the pediatric life support courses. Patrick, please. Muted now, I'm muted. Thanks, Kun. Um, I'll uh, fully agree with my colleagues and build from there on. The future is now. And um, if not already, and I've seen in the chat that a lot of people continue doing courses, uh, we definitely need to restart my conflicts of interest. Uh, I've shared previously, just need to click in there. And there you go. I don't have to do it with clicks then. So we need courses. Uh, to train our people, like Kuhn said, skills are declining. They're declining rapidly. And um, probably not the best few. This is better. Um, we also need them for the people in training, who sometimes even mandatory to get their certification or recertification need to have done our courses. Um, there's definitely a lot of people who do not need a certificate, but there are also people who need it for their practice. So uh, that's an additional reason and hospitals need it for their accreditation and life, if it was only for weeks, maybe, but now with a year on, life continues. We need to adapt to that. Um, specifically for pediatrics, we need to be aware that our manpower in a lot of countries is not that big. And, uh, with all the delays we're having, we're really focused and uh, experiencing the problem that uh, so many people, and it's a good thing, of course, so many people want to do our courses that we will need to decide on priorities. Uh, will this be more about um, people who will do the first time uh, PBLS and EPILS and EPALS? Or uh, should we focus on recertification? We've been talking about recertification for many years in a way. And uh, this was definitely the plan to, to, as was in the educational chapter, to move away from the one time or the few times that you do a big course to a more continuous approach. Uh, but with the reality of, of the delay we've now created in training people, I fear our priority will again be on uh, getting people at least to do this one time the first course and then gradually once, once things become normal again, uh, we will look into recertification more, more thoroughly. Uh, we've been confronted with COVID-19 and this has impact on both the course and the course content, how the courses are run. Uh, they should 
this should still be run. That's definitely clear. And what has changed compared to um, a few months ago is that, of course, for the majority of countries, uh, hopefully and luckily, and uh, I think being in Belgium, we're, we're one of those countries, uh, more and more, if not all, healthcare providers are vaccinated, which does not mean that there should not be uh, any personal protection. No, I think it's still clear that currently uh, courses should be run with masks, with gloves, with proper distancing where it is possible. Uh, but they uh, were probably more safe than they used to be in the beginning. Uh, participants should stay committed to act safely to inform if there's a problem. Ideally, you have smaller group and larger rooms but we would not diminish. And if it's not for the adults and definitely not for the pediatric courses, we need two days. So going to a one day with the online learning is not felt by any of the course directors and national course directors uh, a good thing to do. So we will stick with the two days, maybe with smaller groups, but we will try to do our courses from this point on. Um, as for the content, uh, provider safety has always been important and this should not change in a way. Uh, we should always have been wearing gloves in, in the settings, for instance. Uh, anticipation, communication, thinking about team and team size always have been important. Ventilation uh, in children is crucial. Uh, this is not a different in the COVID um, area. Uh, thinking about protection, definitely, but not diminishing on the importance of ventilation or back mask ventilation. Uh, depending on the reality of your country, uh, in advanced courses, there can be actual training with personal protection equipment, but I think this is really uh, related to your context for the pediatric courses. And then uh, for what concerns these courses, Obviously, when you have new guidelines, you have new content, and so you have new course materials in terms of virtual learning environment. And I can tell you that normally spoken, we will be able to launch for every course this new virtual learning environment in around the 1st of April, maybe even before the during next week. Um, most of the materials are ready and uh, being assembled as we speak. Um, it's never a good idea to combine this sort of big work with also changing courses, but each time we actually do it because at that stage you reevaluate everything you've written. And uh, it is as a good moment for, for the team that's already been working on the content to also look at the learning materials and the way we are doing our courses. There's a lot of similarity with the ALS in that our first day of a course is also an immediate life support. Uh, so this modular approach is very similar. Um, it's also a two-day course, but we changed again a little bit on the uh, flow and content. Um, this is still not finished, so it's a sneak preview, open for discussion, and some of the uh, pediatric colleagues looking at it will say, I have never seen this, that's true, but you will then in a short notice because we are busy discussing it. But we acknowledged in the previous course some difficulties. As you can see, we incorporate, uh, we put a lot of emphasis for those who haven't done the course on recognition. We still include basic life support in the first day. We still include, be it a very short version, uh, a neonatal life support session, because we think that for our public, there are people who will never do a full NLS, but still might be confronted with, with a newborn outside the delivery room. Um, on day two, we readjusted a bit the ALS knowledge and skills session to a larger a combined session, uh, but kept a lot of emphasis, of course, on advanced scenarios. Uh, one of the bigger changes, but still uh, open for discussion and evaluation, is the way we will be running test scenarios, where we, each of uh, 
the candidates will do a scenario as a team member and as a team lead. And so has two evaluation scenarios as a final uh, stage for this course. As said, this will be further discussed with the national course directors. But again, we hope as soon as possible to uh, switch to this uh, new approach or updated approach. There you go. That's it for now. Thank um, you, Patrick. So, I, um, have I, any slides. I have a question from Olympia Nicolaidou, um, and you did make some reference to this in your presentation. But is it a good way to teach PLS EPALS courses ventilating with bag valve masks since ventilation is crucial for sick children? Yeah, what we don't do is we are. Uh, for the moment, although we still advocate it in the guidelines, we do not uh, actually train in mouth-to-mouth -mouth or mouth-to-mouth -mouth nose with mannequins. Uh, I do not think that's a good idea. And uh, this is there's only shown in the virtual learning environment, but we do definitely, because this is actually one of the most crucial skills for pediatric healthcare providers, we do definitely train uh, back mask ventilation, in the critically ill child, as well as in the basic and intermediate advanced life support settings. And uh, Donna Marie Palmer has asked, when will we have e-pills and e-pals? As soon as possible, please. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I was saying. Uh, the, the manuals and the, the materials in the virtual learning environment will be ready next week. We are actually reviewing and uh, we still need a few videos to be updated, but and as well as the ALS and ILS, I think. Um, the paper manuals will need a little bit longer, but not that much. Uh, and then we can start with the translation. So this part of the job is, is almost done. Um, of course, we're also looking at the course content from the instructor perspective. What are you going to tell? What are the sessions? What is the program? And we made a few updates there, but I equally hope that we, we can uh, launch this in, in April. So, uh, so um, yeah. another question from, please excuse my pronunciation of your name, Hafen Hilda Lilia Young's daughter. Uh, Lilia, maybe I'm, hi. <laughs> maybe I missed the information, but when will the next NCD be? The next? National that Course Director Day. Day. That's, that's, some, that's something for Tino. I rest my case. <laughs> Tino, do you want to answer that then? Uh, we, a face-to-face -face meeting will not happen in this year, I'm sure. This is the whole vaccination come together issue is far too complicated. So an, a face-to-face -face meeting, I hope, can be done in 22. Uh, we are continuing having webinars as we had beforehand and I can imagine this depends also on the needs to have at least twice a year or maybe three times a year depending on the needs a, a webinar specifically dedicated to the national course directors this is more how this this should come from the national course director to the to the responsibles in the board there are two representatives of the national course uh, resuscitation councils and they can initiate this very easily. Kuhn, is this more or less also what you're thinking about this? We can certainly do this. We'll, uh, we'll take it back and, uh, and make it work. Yes. Yeah. So Patrick, there is another question from you from Holger Harz. So uh, will, there will be more post MCQ in ePals? This is um... Yes. Well, uh, we need to finalize this discussion, but I think almost all national course directors uh, agreed upon this. I, I know ideally we, we also bring this, of course, to uh, the level of the educational committee, DC Edu, uh, but we will definitely experiment. And the idea is to no longer do a post MCQ. This makes it definitely more important that the pre-MCQ is filled in and mandatory for all participants. 
But we think uh, knowledge and knowledge tests should be at the beginning, and then a con on a continuous base, we keep checking this, obviously. Thank you. That's all the questions directed at yourself, Patrick. So I'll hand back to Kuhn. Thanks, um, thanks, Pat, and thanks, uh, Pat. Uh, and uh, now, last but not least, uh, John Medar about the very small children. NLS, please, John. John, you are still mute. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay. Sorry. Uh, two microphones. One of them wasn't working. Um, so uh, I have no significant conflict of interest. And um, what I'd like to do is just reflect a little bit about NLS, its current situation, how COVID has affected it. Um, where we are now and then where we're going in the future. And NLS um, within Europe is, is of limited impact at the moment. And um, this, is a, this is a strategic issue which uh, affects us now and we need to think about for the future. Um, NLS in the UK is the standard course for all practitioners doing newborn um, practice and that's midwives, medical staff and others. And as a result, there are many courses in the UK. In Europe as a whole, there are not so many courses and they're in a number of countries, some of whom have struggled to establish the course and others who do very well, such as the Netherlands. And the impact of COVID, as you can see in 2020, is a significant shortfall in courses, which uh, have come down um, across the board. And uh, that's one of the impacts. And although it was improving, we're, we're back a bit and we need to think about how we recover the lost ground. Um, and when we look at the countries where uh, newborn resuscitation is practiced, it's not just NLS, there are other courses that are ongoing. Um, and the impact of COVID is not unique to ERC courses, it's to life, life support in general across the board and across all disciplines. Um, and one of the responses has been to just stop doing courses, and that's happened in some countries. Um, and in other countries, it's to restrict the ability to deliver them and then perhaps to modify the course um, to change the mode of delivery in order to be able to cope with some of the restrictions of COVID. Um, and then that, that the response of that has been a reduction in courses um, quite significantly across the board. Um, taking the UK as an example, just because it is numerically um, perhaps stronger, you can see that as COVID impacted, there was a very significant impact on uh, the delivery of courses in, in April and May last year. And then we've seen a gradual uh, recovery in the course delivery model, um, such that now uh, approaching 2020 into 21, the numbers of courses running are now uh, virtually equivalent. And this is admittedly just the UK, but that is reflected in a lot of other countries that have been doing NLS. So the challenges that we've got are a regional variation in the delivery of uh, NLS um, impacted by COVID um, with different resuscitation councils and different areas deciding on a differential approach depending on the impact of COVID in their population. Um, we've now got a significant capacity and backlog issue um, of candidates who should have done the course, who haven't done the course, um, in addition to those that are also uh, expecting to do the course and any new people. Um, impacting upon that, we have the new guidelines and the revisions to the materials with the timeline for that. Um, and on a broader level, um, some examination of what support there is for newborn life support training at local, national and regional level um, with our knowledge through a, a European survey of significant variation across the board. Um, so from the COVID point of view, there is a, a modified timetable um, and this reflects the issues that have been discussed previously around um, infection control and the ability to restrict the risks to those who are a teaching and b those who are learning within those courses um, and in, in essence the course is no different um, it is phased differently the rotations are modified in a way which means that there is less exposure of candidates to rotational issues of instructors and equipment and there is a reduced number of candidates within each group in order to minimize risk 
Uh, and so it is the same generic issues which we've just been discussed. Um, and as with every other course, as participants and instructors are vaccinated, so the worries that are inherent in the transmission of disease are reducing. And certainly within the UK, we're privileged um, in that many healthcare providers are now at least singly vaccinated and most are becoming doubly vaccinated and therefore the risks to those who are A, teaching and B, those who are learning are, are very much reduced. And so at some point this will become more of a historic issue. Um, if we look at the impact in numerical terms, it's really quite sobering. So in 2019, there were 345 courses in the UK, 21 to 24 candidates, that's 7,245 NLS candidates. In 2020, there were 238 courses um, in the year. So we're somewhat down on that. The number of candidates was significantly less at 15 to 16. Um, that meant that the total number of candidates was about half of the usual baseline delivery model. That's a deficit of 3,600 candidates in addition to any new candidates that would have been doing the course. So that's a cumulative deficit. So running restricted courses, that would need 245 extra courses in order to cope with the deficit in addition to what other anticipated course delivery you would expect. So the impact of COVID is, has a long tail, um, long COVID, so to speak, in terms of the impact on catching up. So there are, there are major issues there just logistically and just to being able to deliver the courses uh, to the relevant standards. So there's a compromise required. And one of those has been to extend the recertification interval in such a way as to minimize the impact of the deficit. So as far as new, light, new guidelines are concerned, well, they're out. Um, so that was a, that's a body of work which has taken a while. Um, and as far as NLS material is concerned, it's in publication. Course materials are developed and agreed. Um, and there's a, a delay just in translating that from the UK and then across to the ERC and onto the VLE and onto COSI. And that will happen um, in April, probably in May, to be honest, um, um, knowing the time frame for this. And as far as NLS in Europe is concerned, well, there is an expectation of a gradual increase in courses through the centres that are undertaking um, NLS. Um, some flexibility will be required in dealing with that backlog. Um, and as I said, with some flexibility on recertification dates, but that's a resuscitation council issue at a national level um, and something that each individual region needs to consider. Um, and on a strategic level, um, it's not just about restarting NLS in the centres that have already got NLS. It's about how does NLS then restart its support and development program, um, which is to some degree restricted not by the vaccination of healthcare professionals undertaking or teaching courses, but by other more national things such as travel restrictions. And therefore the timeline to um, support NLS development in countries where it may not yet be so well established who have expressed a wish to to restart or to, to introduce it is slightly challenged and has to be a little bit flexible. Um, and and so, so there's a whole agenda around this and about new areas on um, developing new approaches to NLS and whether or not um, other aspects can be done. So um, we will re the, rebuild the capacity. Um, the new NLS materials will arrive uh, in due course. Um, that's an examination to re-examine the development strategy for NLS within the European context. Um, we're looking at online resources and other ways of delivering it, but it's a quite short course. It's one day, um, and if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So we um, need to be quite careful about how we make changes and the evidence base to support those changes in terms of the learning outcomes from that. Um, and along with all the other courses, we're looking at and examining the issues of lifelong learning um, in the context of support between recertification inter intervals, but there's a fair amount that we need to do before we move on to that aspect as well. So those are the issues that are challenging NLS at the moment. So thank you for that. Um, and hopefully go back towards a more broad discussion. Thanks, John, for this nice overview and, and all the statistics on how COVID affected courses and specifically, specifically the training. Uh, there is no specific question at the moment in the chat, but what came to my mind is how 
there are in some countries of Europe, you mentioned the NLS code is not so popular or even not introduced. Some countries have their own kind of neonatal causes and there is a certain discrepancy between, to say the, the UK way of doing neonatals and maybe the continental. Could you dwell a little bit on this? Yeah, we, we dwell on this a bit, to be honest. Um, there's no one way of doing things and there's no, um, so uh, for some countries they've established newborn training which is based around NLS but isn't NLS and others have established newborn life support training which is based around the NRP which is the uh, American version of same um, and then the Italians for example some centers are undertaking NLS and others have chosen um, a different approach and there's a different national course that they support within Italy and then there are some countries that don't appear to have any strategic approach to newborn life support training at, court, at, at all and it's it reflects healthcare environments. Within the UK, we have a national health service and we've been able to put in place an umbrella system that's imposed across the whole of the country with an expectation that this is the standard. And so we've seen, we've seen a, a, a very significant numerical um, effect in that everybody does the same thing. Um, and that's not always the case. Holland have done, ne Netherlands have done similarly. So they have a national course. Um, and it's very much an issue for individual resuscitation councils as to how they approach this. So what we've done is we've now got some information on a national basis by a, a European wide survey. So we know where the, the hotspots are in terms of targeting um, questions about NLS delivery at a, resusc as a, a national level. And we're hoping to use that constructively to, to help um, you know, explore why NLS is not the favoured course. And if, if it isn't, what, what we can do, uh, and particularly for those where uh, newborn life support is unstructured, to be able to offer a structured course and to work out what resources we need to be able to put in to be able to develop it at uh, resource stage guys levels. So there's a fair amount of work to be done um, on, on that level. Thanks. Uh, I would like to go back to Kuhn for the general discussion maybe now. We still have a quarter of an hour. Uh, thank you. That's very, uh, very kind of you. Uh, but the question is, are there any other questions we need to address? And if so, I would very much like to hear them from any one of you. Um, I don't think in the, in the chat there are any burning, um, burning issues that we haven't uh, really touched on. Um, yeah, there's one, one comment. Uh, yeah. who is asking if one ALS certified team leader is sufficient to improve yeah. outcome. Indeed, there are studies and we have even a meta analysis on this and this is included in the ILCO statement and also in the guidelines that if even one person in a resuscitation team is trained by an, an, a certified advanced life support course, the outcome of patient is better. So this is a huge argument. It's for the first time we have really the evidence that these kind of courses, accredited advanced life support courses for ALS and for neonatal. So for both, there's a British Journal of Medicine study on, on neonatal are improving patient outcome. So this is therefore go on, teach people as much as, much as possible. But, uh, uh, Tino, it doesn't mean that you cannot have more than one ALS of trained course. person in a team, of course, I think, you know. But, but, it, but at least um, what I also hear from Karsten is that we need to target the, you know, the appropriate course to the appropriate uh, team member. Mm -hmm. and, and, and can you, Karsten, I was, um, I was interested by what you said about the position of the immediate life support course and i understood that this is like more or less an als course and maybe the als course that we currently have is more an advanced course for team training team leaders did i understand that correctly or is that not what you meant 
this is what I meant. Uh, this is uh, these are my thoughts for the future of our core system, uh, and this is what we need to further elaborate. But if you look into the programs and I compared immediate life support to advanced cardiac life support, so ACLS, the AHA product. Uh, so mid life support is comparable to ACLS. Uh, this is what the AHA teaches. Uh, so we can offer that as a one-day product. This is what most providers out there need. Uh, we will achieve uh, sufficient competencies in these providers. Uh, and this has been one of my first slides, clearly indicating the objectives of that course format. Uh, nevertheless, um, immediate life support is, is a brand, is a trademark of ESC. Uh, so we need to carefully think about renaming things or doing something like that. Uh, on the other hand, and um, I didn't show uh, these slides, um, we plan comparable to what Patrick has um, shown early on in his slides, but we decided with the Science Education Committee not to change the structure of our adult courses at the moment, because the number of courses uh, all over the world is much too small to be able to pilot changes in a way that we can say, okay, now they are fit for purpose and we can roll them out, because this is what we did in former years. You know, when we started changing the structure of our courses. We went to different countries all over Europe and in the world and we did pilot courses and we tried to make the changes fit for purpose in a way that uh, the ones who are going to run these courses in the future um, are able to do so and we are able to transfer what we plan into our instructor pool. Uh, so this is why we're not doing it now but um, we're going to do so in, let's say, 2022, 2023. Yeah, so kind of using the UK approach on now implementing the new guidelines and then looking deeply into the structure and applying changes to the structure later on. And so um, in my opinion, and this is what we already discussed in the Science Education Committee, we need to further improve the content versus teaching. And um, yeah, building the uh, team leadership competencies in the ALS part, so on the second part of our course. Mm -hmm. uh, there are quite a lot of questions about the UK and the ERC in Europe. To make it very clear, the, the Resuscitation Council UK is operating all courses in the United Kingdom and you use your own learning management system. The continental Europe Courses are running under the ERC course management system. It's co called COSI now, uh, to make it very clear for all of you. Thank you, Tino. Um, I, I had a question for, uh, for Petri because is, is in, in pediatric life support, is the same like happening in recalibrating like one day, two day courses for one day courses more for the, the standard and then the two-day course is more for the leadership yeah definitely but um and i think together with Carson, we've been struggling in a way in rebalancing because we do experience also that that a lot of uh, definitely a proportion of people attending the epulse as the original standard course would be better suited with an epulse um which is which actually should be the main course in a way uh, but um this is a shift and it's slowly and epulse is still the strongest course of the two and in many countries it's the only one and there's no epulse running uh in other countries it's picking up uh so this is one of the things we want to invest in is, is making this epulse epulse one day course, which is actually much more interesting for, for a lot of people in a way, also from a time perspective, uh, the D course they would do. Um, but it, and, and I do think maybe changing names would make a difference, but uh, it's a brand. And, and like Carsten already said, uh, you have to be careful to then start changing names. It, it's often a difficult thing once you have a, such a strong branding. Okay, but it's certainly something that you're all thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wanna, yes, Tino, yes. Maybe we, there's a, an interesting question. We, we yeah. might discuss a little bit of this. 
how can we initiate courses or promote courses in areas where there are no officially training institutes uh, outside of Europe or in Europe. So there's a lot of low resource settings mm -hmm. and there are quite a lot of initiatives also from the ESC about this. So for the adult part, we already did a lot of that. Yeah? As you know, we started courses in Northern Africa. We started courses even in Sri Lanka yeah, on their request. And um, as we, we sent faculties there and we tried to uh, gain the resources necessary for that. But I cannot really imagine that there's a place somewhere in the world where we will not be able uh, to start our course system. I don't think so either, especially because the VLE is, is just, it's a, a low, low technical in a way that you only need an internet and a browser and that's it. So, so there's no um, technical materials needed for now, which makes it actually very accessible. We've, for instance, have, have the need, like you said, in, in Sri Lanka, but in Nepal for children, etc. Uh, what you do need, of course, is, is uh, a few, at least a few dedicated people in the local area. Uh, it's not something we would do without having dedicated local people. But once you have that, you can you can definitely start, and and it even will be more than in the previous. I've seen in in John's slide as well that in several countries waiting to start. It's the same for pediatrics. Uh, we need to have a, a clear trajectory and a plan of, of how we make this sort of a initial trajectory working uh, for the local people uh, so that it's also cost effective in terms of the amount of faculty that you need to bring in in the beginning and these sort of things. So if you look at the initiative from uh, Klaus Meyer uh, in Uganda, uh, mm -hmm. this is a real success story uh, that happened over the past year. And they managed to build up a course center over there and they're running a huge number of courses in the meantime. Yeah? Yeah. So if you got somebody that is taking care, uh, then this works perfectly well. Mm -hmm. Pat? Yeah, I just noticed a question from John Tobin and I know this is something Carson, you've thought about a lot, which is, having the the test to be the whole team and not individuals um, with two instructors so have you moved further or plan to develop that idea of team testing yes, sure we have uh, so uh, this is at the moment in the stage of discussion between tino and myself uh, i sent him a document on that just been part of my master thesis uh, when I did my master of medical education. Uh, so we have some data on that. We plan to implement it in the advanced life support courses, but we are not as far as the pediatrics are at the moment. But I'm sure this will be part of the structural change in advanced uh, life support in 2022 or 2023. Uh, only to add to this, we did a study showing, and in the same setting, having the individual approach and the team approach that obviously the, the team, the human factors are better uh, to test in a team approach. Interestingly, the, the knowledge, skills and all the other stuff is, is pretty the same. Uh, I think evidence is enough there. We need to work out how to do this and how to, to make, this is a, a substantial change in all these courses we have in the, on the ERC level because up to now, this is a, a very traditional one-to-one -one testing for the last 20 years. And to make such a tr transition has to be prepared quite well to, uh, to avoid a huge confusion we, we already had with COSI and stuff like this. But I think this is the way where we have to go in the next future. I, uh, I have seen some remarks in, in this session and also in previous sessions that we, we in the, uh, as presenters, have not addressed non-technical skills, human factors enough, or maybe almost not, not at all. Um, is this, was this a, it was certainly not a deliberate choice, but have we not stressed enough non-technical skills? Is it still, just to confirm, is it still a, a very significant part of our courses 
maybe that's a better question. And can we address it now, maybe briefly? Patrick, you always say that this is a, a, a longitudinal, longitudinal skills over all the two days. Yeah, it is, but it builds up. It's it's very similar to what to what adult uh, what Carson is doing is that day two focuses on um, this team approach and the non technical skills. There's still a bit knowledge skill part on on advanced life support as such, but but the whole scenarios and the way we are running scenarios now is focused on anticipation, communication, and non technical skills. Uh, obviously, there are knowledge points in there, uh, and like Karst, I hear Carson saying as well, is two days is still short. You could definitely do more, but you could always do more. Uh, so you need to mix knowledge in there as well. But but and 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 therefore the assessment, uh, not only as an individual, but also in a team, looking at communication and and interaction and anticipation. Uh, is something we even now will, will try to use in the in the final testing as a final evaluation and the final feedback we are giving to a candidate after the two days. Mm. So I this is when you go on life support, we're slightly different. Um, that's not to say that human factors are not important. And in fact, in the UK, we have um, the Arnie course, which is a more advanced course, which is very much based around communication and human factors. But for newborn life support, um, the critical factor defining the outcome for the baby is the ability of the individual there at the time of birth to recognize that the baby is unwell and to be able to do critical practical tasks well. Um, and those are the defining issues, the ability to undertake those practical tasks in a sufficiently appropriate manner. And so Newborn life support acknowledges human factors and all the relevant issues around communication, but actually the critical issue um, fundamentally for the individual is the ability to undertake certain practical tasks. So that's the focus of NLS, even though the team factors and the human factors and all of that are acknowledged. They're not the critical factors for that baby at that time with that individual. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe a last message because the people are asking. Obviously, maybe there's a misunderstanding. All for all course formats, there will be new material uh, in the next week. So for advanced life support and intermediate life support in adults, pediatric, EPALS and EPALS, as well as neonatal and BLS. So all course formats will have over the next week new formats and. As soon as these are online, uh, a message will go out to all the instructors, Patrick. Oh? Yeah, try to help us remember. Yeah. That we send out a message. But you'll see it in you'll see it in Cozy, obviously. Yeah, but um, I don't check Cozy every day. <laughs> really? <laughs> Come on, you're the director of education. Uh, I have good people working. <laughs> <laughs> so with this, uh, we, we may safely and confidently conclude this, uh, this session. Um, thank you all participants for sharing your experiences and views and for asking so many questions to improve uh, our new courses. Uh, thank you to all the, the experts the co-chairs of education of the science and education committees and our two moderators, Pat and, uh, and Tino. Thank you so much. Um, there is, for those interested in first aid, there is maybe mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the last part of the first aid session that you may catch if you are quick uh, in uh, track A and, and, and also uh, industry partners have some interesting sessions uh, going on uh, in track C. And if uh, that is um, not your, your, um, your taste, then we would certainly like to, to see you again at 4.30 for the closing session, uh, which will be uh, quite interesting. And, uh, and uh, both Federico and myself will be, uh, will be uh, present uh, amongst others. 
So uh, see you there and um, thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.